Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship located on page two of your bulletin. Welcome to the Banquet of Hope, the open bar of prayer, the anonymous circle of acceptance. We come, come because, because we are invited. invited. Welcome to a fiesta of joy or a mercy meal of tenderness where every seat is a place of honor. We come come because, because we are invited. Welcome to a party for God's love reveal where all seating is a circle and karaoke is never necessary because we sing our own stories. We come because we have an invitation, not on paper, simply our names. Welcome to the banquet of hope, the open bar of prayer, the anonymous circle of acceptance. Let us pray. God, we come this gathering of community where there are no barriers and all our abilities are celebrated as gifts. We come to receive your hospitality of caring for each one of us and to learn from you how to offer such a celebration to stranger, friend, chosen family, those whose faces are unfamiliar to us and the face who meets us in the mirror. Amen. Good morning, beloved. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are so glad that you have come to worship this morning at Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on this journey of life, you are welcome in this place. And we are glad that you are here with us in person and we want to say special words of welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. And we, I know we can't do our usual uh, wave because we're in a different place today. But let's give a round of applause and clap to celebrate our online worshipers. And we want you to know that in this place at Plymouth Church, uh, I'm brought back to a song, actually, a song that says, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Some of us might remember that, where it says, red, yellow, black, brown, and white, they are precious in God's sight. Well, we want you to know, red, brown, black, yellow, white, you are precious in God's sight. If you came to this place walking with a cane, or if you were able to leap across the grass, we want you to know that you were welcome in this place. If you have black hair, if you have brown hair, if you have white hair, we want you to know that you are welcome in this place. If you have zero friends on Facebook, or if you have 5,000, you are precious in God's sight and welcome in this place. Man, woman, boy, girl, we want you to know that you are welcome in this place. If you have a trust fund or if you are decide to decide between milk and medicine, we want you to know that you are precious in God's sight and are welcome in this place. And we stand with you. We want you to know that at Plymouth Church, that we remove the barriers here, all are precious in God's sight, and all are welcome, just as you are. So welcome one, welcome all to Plymouth Church, and let the people of God say, so I am delighted uh, this morning to extend a special welcome, as we all are, to the Reverend Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III, uh, Senior Pastor of the Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, uh, who is in, uh, in the city of Syracuse this morning and accepted the invitation to come here and proclaim the gospel in this place. And he is accompanied by uh, the love of his life, uh, the one and only Deborah P. Keynes. It's been a joy to meet her and be with them this morning. And they are celebrating this weekend 35 years of marriage. So happy anniversary. And we are so glad and honored that you've taken the time on your anniversary to come and spend some of it uh, with us. So we want you to know that we, are love, we love you. And even though you're coming here for today and you're going back to Dallas, y'all are forever now part of the family here. So uh, if any way we could ever be of support to you or stand with you, know that we're here. And, uh, and I think that there's, a, there's some fact behind that because Dr. Haynes and I are also classmates. 
So we are getting ready for comprehensive exams. So we are still, yes, we are still going to be leaning on one another either way. <laughs> But for those who don't know him, let me introduce him to you, and I'm going to read a little bit of his bio off of uh, the website. Uh, Reverend Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III is a prophetic pastor, passionate leader, social activist, eloquent orator, and educator engaged in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and fighting against racial injustice. Dr. Haynes is also committed to and has devoted his life to economic justice and empowerment in underserved communities and touching and transforming the lives of the disenfranchised. For the past 38 years, Dr. Haynes has served as a visionary and innovative senior pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And under his servant leadership, the ministry and membership of the church has grown from less than 100 members in 1983 to over 12,000. He was born in 1960 to the late Reverend Frederick D. Haynes Jr. and Lynetta Haynes Oliver. And after experiencing racism in the segregated South, Dr. Haynes' father decided it was best to move his family to San Francisco, where his father, Dr. Frederick D. Haynes, passed to the historic Third Baptist Church. And it was there that he received uh, his call to ministry. Dr. Haynes has earned his Master's of Divinity degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, as well as a Doctorate of Ministry degree from the Graduate Theological Foundation, where he was afforded the opportunity to study at Christ Church, Oxford University in England. And he is pursuing a Doctor of Philosophy degree in African American preaching and sacred rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary. Uh, and, there are so, and if you look inside of your bulletins, there is so much more information about Dr. Haynes. But one of the things I love about Dr. Haynes is his courage to be able to actually speak truth to power uh, in the times where he does not wait until it is comfortable or when it is safe to speak up. But what I always notice about him and appreciate about him is his willingness to have the courage to say what needs to be said uh, even when it is unpopular to say so. Uh, he was one of the first pastors in the nation uh, of a, one of the first pastors in the nation to actually to actively speak out against uh, homophobia, uh, and there's so much more that I can say about Dr. Haynes and his prophetic uh, preaching ministry. But getting to know him personally, I want to getting to know him personally though. Uh, one of the things I love about him is his genuine heart. Uh, he indeed is somebody who is a caring and loving person. And uh, when I first met him, I didn't know how to, what do I do with a, someone of this stature? And that's my classmate, how, you know, and he said, just call me Freddie. And on that day, uh, that, that, uh, that did it for me, uh, that uh, this was uh, someone that I can actually open up to and actually build relationship with. And it has been an honor uh, to be in touch with him and to be, uh, be, for him to be a part of my life. And he was one of the people before I had my surgery on May 24th, uh, that sent me uh, one of the most uh, best prayers and messages of encouragement and offered uh, to pray for me and with me. I woke up, I was getting up at three that morning, and then I see a message pop up on my phone that when I got up in the morning from none other than Dr. Freddie Haynes uh, wishing me well. And it was a long text message uh, wishing me well and letting me know that he was praying for me. And that meant the world uh, to me because it was a very, for me, having the procedure that I had that y'all know about, uh, indeed, it was a day where I was venturing out to the unknown. So I want you to know that meant the world to me. So not only is he a great preacher, a great pastor, but he's a great person. And so is his lovely wife. So you are in for a treat today. Now, I need to share some announcements with you all. Just to fill your briefcases, your, your, uh, your tote bags, whatever it is that you carry, and bring it to church on that Sunday so we can bless them and offer prayers as we start the new program year. Also, nursery care will be resuming. Nursery care will be resuming on that Sunday as well, along with learning community. And we're going to be kicking off our sermon series, Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries, questions my learning community or Sunday school teacher never answered. And we have received some, a lot of good questions, and the series has been planned, uh, and, we're, and we're gonna have some more information for you then.
So those are our announcements this morning. Oh, and one last thing, we're going to be having after church today, stick around, and we're going to be having, uh, just having a meal together, having a little church picnic together, and I see y'all are already in position uh, for that, and you're already in your places, so that's wonderful, but I just wanted you to know uh, and remind you that we're going to be having a time for fellowship through our church picnic. And Dr. Joseph Downing in his uh, act of uh, act of uh, care, and him and uh, Will, Willard Doswell, if you don't have a lunch, uh, they have prepared uh, sandwiches and salad for those who may not have a meal with them today. So please don't let the meal be a barrier to your participation. There is something for you to eat, and there is something for you to drink. So, beloved, the words that Jesus first uttered after the resurrection was, Peace be unto you. And ancient Christian communities continued to say those words to one another as a reminder that we are a community of reconciliation, we are a community of radical and extravagant love, and we are a community of friends. So now we do that with one another through the passing of the peace. Peace be unto you. Let us now share a sign of peace. And we'll have the song of praise, and then Dr. Haynes will get up and share the scripture and his message. Permit me to express my appreciation to your wonderful pastor, uh, Eric Jackson, for his gracious, generous, even hyperbolic words of uh, introduction. I was praying for him uh, as he was introducing me uh, because he was so extravagant uh, that it started to sound like he was lying about me. And so uh, I prayed that God would forgive him for lying and then forgive me because I love the way he lied about me. And so I praise God for him. I praise God for the bigness of his heart, uh, the greatness of his mind, and the beauty of his spirit. I think you already know that you are blessed with a wonderful uh, man of God in Pastor Eric Jackson. I am so proud uh, that I am in cohort with him uh, in this PhD adventure. Uh, he is a blessing. You'd be real proud of him in class because uh, sometimes we have to make presentations and uh, a few courses, a few classes ago, uh, he made a presentation before me. And so when he finished, uh, I was so angry at him because it was so good uh, that there was basically nothing left to say. And so uh, I am wondering why I'm up here today preaching after him because, again, I know what it's like uh, to preach after him because there's nothing left to say. So I appreciate his gifts and appreciate the warmth of his spirit and his wonderful wife. Let me also uh, re-acknowledge my beautiful wife of 35 years tomorrow, uh, August 29th. 35 years ago, uh, she said, I do, and I know you look at her and say, but she only looks 35. I get it. Uh, she looks even better today than she did 35 years ago when she walked down the aisle. And so I salute my wonderful wife, Deb. Did you already stand? Yeah, that's my beautiful wife, Deb. So I thank God for, for her and the blessed privilege. We're going to have to leave right afterwards because uh, as much as I love Syracuse, uh, I need to take her to the Hamptons for, for the celebration, okay? So this is the pre, this is the appetizer, uh, Syracuse's appetizer, and then the main course uh, is in the Hamptons. I want to call your attention in these few moments to a passage of scripture from the Message Translation, Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. It reads, they went to Phrygia and then on through the region of Galatia, their plan was to turn west into Asia province, 
But the Holy Spirit blocked that route. So they went to Mycenae and tried to go north to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go there either. Proceeding on through Mycenae, they went down to the seaport Troas. That night, Paul had a dream. A Macedonian stood on the far shore and called across the sea, come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave Paul his map. We went at once, we went to work at once, getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia. All the pieces had come together. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. I want to put a tag on this text, and in these few moments, I want to talk about what happens to a dream deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? It's not lost on me that 59 years ago today, the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr., in Washington, D.C., in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial, stood, and after narrating the nightmare that characterized the journey of far too many African Americans in a nation born in the sin of a hostile takeover and shaped by the iniquity of anti-black racism, Martin King Jr. stood and declared, I have a dream. Of course, Martin King has suffered from identity theft, and there are those who are guilty of taking out of context the beautiful poetry of the dream he so artistically articulated while ignoring the nightmare he prophetically critiqued. On that August 28th, 1963, Martin King declared, I have a dream, but we all know that within a few weeks, September 15th of that same year, the third Sunday in September, a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church there in Birmingham, Alabama. Four little girls were killed while studying Sunday school. Several other acts of violence occurred and Martin King then in an interview testify transparently, no longer do I have a dream, but I have witnessed too much of the American nightmare. Martin Luther King Jr. had declared on August the 28th, I have a dream, but then Martin Luther King Jr. understood and identified with the poetic brilliance of one Paul of one Langston Hughes who in one aspect of his literary career simply encouraged, exhorted all when he said, hold fast to dreams for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams for if dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. And then later in his literary career, Langston Hughes raises the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, fester like a sore and then run or does it stink like rotten meat crust and sugar over like a syrup is sweeter maybe it sags like a heavy load or does it just explode yes I am suggesting on this August 28th 2022 that the question what happens to a dream deferred is something that we must grapple with because the same king who declared I have a dream then was interviewed and said I no longer see the American dream because I've been bombarded with the American nightmare. This nightmare perhaps was articulated artistically by who is it? Jay, uh, Jay-Z, Beyonce's husband. When Jay puts it like this, Jay testifies here it is, everybody want to be king till shots ring and you're laying on a balcony with holes in your dream 
name. Wow, what a rapturous way to articulate what has taken place in what Maya Angelou would call these yet to be United States of America, a whole in the dream of Dr. King. Ludacris puts it like this. I dream I could tell Martin Luther we made it, but half of my black brothers are still incarcerated. What are both of them suggesting? They're suggesting that in this thing called life, our dreams can be hijacked by disappointing nightmares. Our We can walk by faith into a nightmare of disappointment. Yes, no matter who you are, how big your Bible is, how long you've been going to church, we know that life in a real sense can allow our nightmares to hijack our dreams. And the question becomes, what is it that we are to do? I bring to the witness stand a, a young man who considers me a mentor. His name is Tashawn. And Tashawn shared with me that after he graduated from Hampton University there in Hampton, Virginia, he was excited with expectation because he had, to quote him, killed his phone interview with the Fortune 500 company that was based in Chicago. And they had told him that they wanted to meet him and interview him in person the week after graduation. Check out what happens. He boards the flight to go from uh, to go from Richmond, Virginia to Chicago, Illinois. But when he boards the flight, he discovers through the announcement of the pilot, sadly, that there, and this is the word of the pilot, there is something wrong with the system. And so we're going to have to change planes. That's what happened. There was something wrong with the system and they had to change planes. That meant there was a delay. Understand to Sean is excited with expectation. His dream is going to come true. He is going to have a job probably with the Fortune 500 company based there in Chicago. But the system had messed up what he was looking forward to. As a consequence, the flight is delayed getting to Chicago. He had discovered through his research that the senior VP who was interviewing him at a restaurant on the north side of town was a fan of the Chicago Bulls, loved Scottie Pippen, and he had arranged through a connection for to, to, to get a, an autographed jersey of Scottie Pippen. And so he made his way to the south side and then drives to the north side, putting in the address to the restaurant where he is going. Check out what happens. He follows the directions to a T, but he ends up at an empty lot. Why? Because he soon discovers the restaurant had just moved and had reopened up around the corner. He finally gets to the restaurant. When he gets to the restaurant, the concierge says, are you Tashan? He says, yes, this note was left for you. The note read like this. I give it to you. The note read, dear Tashan, first impressions are lasting. Too bad this is your last impression. Good luck with your future pursuits in getting a job, but you will not get this one. Imagine the heartbreak break up to shine. He had been energized with expectation, but everything had gone wrong. The directions had gone wrong. Everything had gone wrong. The system on the plane did not allow him to take off. Everything had gone wrong. I park here parenthetically because I think that's something all of us can identify with, and that is when we are trying to do right, life has a way of going terribly wrong. Oftentimes, it's systems that will mess up what it is we are trying to get done. And so that brings me to our text. The Bible lets us know the gospel globetrotter and trailblazing theologian from Tarsus, the, artis the, uh, the artistically articulate African apostle Paul himself. The book lets us know that Paul is trying to get the Bible says to Asia, but all of a sudden something goes wrong. The spirit does not allow them to go. He then seeks to go to Bithynia and that way is blocked. Look 
at what is going on. Paul has been on a missionary journey, but everything seems to be falling apart. It looks bad for the apostle Paul because nothing is working the way that he wants it to work. Wait, I'm going to mess you up because when you think about it, check out what happens. The common denominator in all of the doors being shut is the Holy Spirit. And maybe we need to have a theology of blocked doors, a theology that lets us know that every now and then you can walk by faith into a shut door of disappointment. You can dream your way into a nightmare that happened to the apostle Paul. Wait, I'm still not coming through like I need to because Paul, watch this, is trying to go to Asia, but the Bible lets us know that the spirit did not allow him to go. Wait, I got le- to show it to you the way it reads in scripture. It says he was forbidden by the spirit, knowing I'm preaching here at Plymouth for my cohort mate, Eric Jackson. I had to do my homework and etymologically, I unpacked the word forbidden in the original Greek language. And y'all, the word is powerful. The word is powerful because in the original Greek, it simply means he was cut off. And then it means not only cut off, but everything fell apart. Are you getting it? Do you see the picture? He's on his way to Asia, but everything falls apart. Wait, it gets worse because now he tries to go to Bithynia. And the Bible says in the Greek construction, he literally got to the very door of Bithynia. And that's when the door was rudely slammed shut. Oh my God, look what Paul is experiencing. I'm talking about the gospel globetrotter. Everything falls apart going to Asia. And then as soon as he gets to the door of Bithynia, that's when the door is shut, denying what he was looking forward to. What happens to a dream deferred? That's why Langston also said what happens to a dream deferred from river to river, uptown and down. There's liable to be confusion when your dreams get kicked around. Paul can identify with that. And yet the Bible lets us know that when your dreams are deferred, God is up to something. When life does not work out the way you want it to, God still comes through. Preach Freddie Haynes. I think I just did that. God has a way of coming through when life does not work out for you. And I think that's the testimony that we can share with this nation in these days when we are watching the onslaught on democracy where a neo-fascist spirit is trying to take over what's happening in this nation. I am pastoring in a state I call Texas. I had to add an S to the suffix because of all of the stuff coming out of Texas that is fascist and as a consequence there in Texas we came up with some kind of voter suppression that denies what democracy is all about to make matters worse the bodily autonomy of women is under assault no it's been wiped out in a country if we're honest we are in such a dangerous time that women in the state of Texas and it's spreading throughout the country have fewer rights than guns in this nation and there's something sick and evil about that what happens to a dream deferred God is still on in control God is still up to something what does the text let us know I'll give you these and I'm done the text lets us know that God has a way that when things are falling apart God is constructing something brand Brand new. Oh, that's good right there. God can allow life to fall apart as you know it. And then out of the broken pieces of your plans and dreams, construct something brand new, construct something that sets the stage for 
or an aspect of life you wouldn't have experienced had your life not fallen apart. I cannot come to this area without paying tribute to that woman called Moses, Harriet Tubman, the Moses of her people. You know Harriet Tubman as that great emancipator. After self-emancipating, she then went back down south, and when she went back down south, she was going to get her husband only to discover that her husband had remarried in her absence. Her heart is broken. She testifies, why God? Why did you let me come? I heard from you. Why did you let me come back here only to have this all in my face? But then watch what happened in that moment. Harriet Tubman heard from God that you're not just coming back to rescue your husband. You're coming back to begin a process of emancipating other enslaved persons. She at one moment thought that her dream was to just rescue her family. Instead, she made some 13, at least 13 trips back down south and rescued so many others. Why? Because it was out of her broken plans that God put together a mission for Harriet Tubman that Harriet has become known for. God is awesome in that even when our hearts are broken, if we give the broken pieces to God, God can take the pieces and stitch them together and form a purpose bigger than the broken pieces of our broken hearts. That was good right there, but please understand that Harriet Tubman was simply piggybacking on what happened to Paul because the book says everything fell apart, but all of us recognize that for the very first time, the gospel which had already gone south into Africa had gone east toward Asia for the very first time it crosses a border and goes into Europe. The gospel had not gone into Europe. It goes where it had never gone before. Why did it go where it had not gone before? Because everything fell apart. It did. It went where it had not gone before because of a door that had been shut. What happens to a dream deferred? A dream deferred allows us to reimagine brand new possibilities. No wonder Jeremiah Wright tells us that we ought to remember that we have an opportunity to do something dynamic and powerful when we think about a country that was wrongly constituted. I said it already. It was born in a hostile takeover and shaped by anti-black racism. What do you do with that? It means it's constituted by way of injustice. And Jeremiah Wright says if you bake a cake, pull the cake out of the oven and discover, oh my God, I forgot to add sugar. Do you pour sugar on top of the cake? No. He says it's time to take, it's time to bake a brand new cake. And maybe that's where we are in this nation because we were constituted in a way that was based on injustice. And as a consequence, injustice continues to compound itself. And maybe it's time for we who call ourselves people of faith who love God to say let's rebake the American cake and ensure it is a cake that is constituted by love, constituted by justice, constituted by liberty and justice for all. Preach Freddie Haynes. I'm doing the best I can but hold on. Watch it because the text also says it is in the dark that God allows us to see the light. That was good. It's really in the text because the text says, here it is, Eric. The text says, at night, Paul is in Troas, and while at night in Troas, he receives a vision. A man from Macedonia, come over here and help us. You missed your shout. I got to give it to you again. It's at nighttime in Troas that he receives a vision. A man from Macedonia says, come over here and help us because every now and then God allows life to go dark in order for us to see the light. I didn't come through, did I? 
Uh, uh, oh, this is good right here. Uh, Eric, last Sunday, I'm watching television, and there is a, a commercial, and the commercial is of a particular cell phone, and the cell phone, I'm about to shout, the cell phone has what they call night sight. Night sight, which means that with the cell phone, its camera can take pictures in the dark. I got to go back and grab you because the cell phone says just because it goes dark, it does not mean that I cannot take a picture of something that is beautiful because I have night sight. It hit me. When you walk by faith, you are gifted with night sight, and that night sight basically allows you to take a picture of preferred possibilities in spite of the dark situation that you find yourself in. Oh, America, the good news is there are night sight Christians who attend Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ who have made up their mind in the darkness of what the country may be going through right now. Our night sight allows us to see a nation where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Night sight allows you to see a nation where we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Let's use our night sight. And in using our night sight, it's simply saying we may be in a dark time, but in darkness, God allows us to see the light. Well, I got to let you know finally that the text says this, that when our plans are broken, God is building something Something brand new. I love how the message translation wraps it up in verse 10 when it says everything had fallen together. All had come together. We understood now what had taken place. The, the shut door, everything falling apart. It all was designed to take us into brand new possibilities. Well, I know what's going on and I love that about this congregation. Y'all know how to hear a sermon real well because y'all are sitting there and you're really anxious about shouting but you're concerned about shouting and celebrating because of the fact that you're also listening and thinking and you're listening and thinking and you're saying but hold on what about Tashawn you left Tashawn in Chicago and everything had gone wrong everything had fallen apart is that the end of Tashawn's story you know it's not the end of Deshaun's story. I'm glad you want to hear the rest of it. One of my friends, Lance Watson, says whenever you hear a Freddie Haynes sermon, he engages in teleological suspension in that, and Michael Eric Dyson piggybacks and says, I engage in homiletical cliffhangers in that I give you something, but then there's an end to it, but you got to hold on to get to the end, and so here's the end that y'all have been waiting on to shout about I'm done to Sean's testimony is he said Freddie please hear what God did God is so good I get to the restaurant the concierge gives me the note I'm standing there tears are welling up in my eyes and that's when a waitress walks up to me and the waitress says are you to Sean who that man was waiting on and I said yes and she said well he was mean you don't want to work for him any Anyway, because he was cheap he didn't give a tip after drinking at the bar and so what we're going to do we're going to I'm going to treat you to dinner at this restaurant and to Sean said are you serious but the prices are out of my price range I just graduated he's walking to his seat she said oh where'd you graduate from and he said Hampton University she said well Hampton has produced a fine young man like you and we're going to treat Treat you to the best dinner you've had for your graduation present. He sat down, and the person who was seated in the uh, in 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 the chair in the area behind him turned around and said, "Did you say you graduated from Hampton? I'm a graduate of Hampton. As a matter of fact, I'm vice president of the National Hampton Alumni Association. What are you doing in Chicago?" He then told the vice president of the association 
Alumni Association, why he was there and what had happened. He said, oh, I thought that was the vice president of such and such company. They're trying to get a contract with my company and we're meeting with them next week. And so what I'm going to do when they come to meet with us next week, they're going to have to sit and give a presentation to you because I'm hiring you right now on the spot. And when I hire you on the spot, I can't wait to see his face next week when he has to make a presentation to you. And what you say will have everything to do with whether or not they get our contract. Well, I'm done, but I'm trying to let everybody know when you walk by faith and not by sight, yes, you may walk into disappointment, but God can convert disappointment into a divine appointment. And when God converts it into a divine appointment, you can say with Beyonce to every disappointment, you won't break my soul. You can say with Kendrick Lamar, all's my life I had to fight. But if God's got us, we going to be all right. We going to be all right because God is still in control. We going to be all right because the arc of the moral universe is long, Dr. King said, but it bends toward justice. We going to be all right because James Russell Lowe is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown stands God within the shadows keeping watch above his own. We going to be all right because the hymn writer put it so well. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. God's truth is marching on.
Please be seated. So now, beloved, it is prayer time. And prayer is a time where we, we orient ourselves with what our preacher shared this morning with our night sight. In the midst of all the dreams that have been uh, deferred in life, prayer is a time to center ourselves so we might be able to see the brand new possibilities that are available to us through God. This is a time for us to open our night sight, to open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear the glimpses of truth that God has for us. So on this day, we invite those who are worshiping with us online to send your prayer requests via Facebook. And I want to now just read our joys and our concerns as we lift them up, which can be found in your bulletins. We pray this day for PV George, who is battling COVID-19, uh, for Jack Ziegler, friend of Leela and Maria's, cover, recovering from complications from heart surgery, a broken neck, and now gallstones. Eleanor Russell being treated for pneumonia, for Elaine Hobson, a friend of Elizabeth McKinney, recovering from COPD. Sonia Brandon, Myron Holmes' sister, diagnosed with cancer. Monica Haggerty, a friend of Reverend Andrea Steckel. Mabel Wilson, suffering from a herniated disc in her back. And for God to continue to heal Lulu Myers quickly and fully restore her vision, as well as to guide her parents, Joyce and Dennis, with medical decisions along the way. Peter Gordon and Jane Zorn Gordon, undergoing continued treatments for cancer. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to God. Let us pray. Oh God, here we come now. God who is our creator, God who is our sustainer, God who is our redeemer. The God who the psalmist describes in the 46th Psalm as being our refuge and our strength. The one who is a very present help in the time of trouble. The one who the psalmist describes as our shepherd, who makes sure that we do not want. Our God who is with us, even if we ascend to the highest mountain or go into the deepest valley, the God who is always with us. But God, we confess this day, indeed as reflected in our joys and concerns list, while we have many joys and reasons to be thankful, reasons to celebrate, we come today too, O oh Lord, with our deferred dreams. The dreams and the things that keep us up at night that are broken. The suffering that we go through when we experience health challenges and complications. When we experience bad news from the doctor. Those broken dreams, those dreams that it feels like the dream has been deferred. When our loved ones are no longer with us taken from us abruptly, or even if we saw it coming along the way. The pain is very real, O oh God, so we confess, O oh Lord, that we come this day with dreams that we feel have been deferred. We lift up to you those right now, God, who are faced with economic challenges right now on the brink and teetering on, teetering on the brink of poverty right now. We lift up those to you who are economically struggling. But God, as we lift up all of our concerns on our joys and concerns list, the concerns on our hearts that are not published in this bulletin, the concerns that are on Facebook, those concerns that sit on our hearts that we dare not share, let us remember, O oh God, that you are with us. And even the things that we keep within our hearts that are going on in our personal lives, even the suffering that is happening in our world as a result of injustice, broken systems, toxic institutions, and ideas that continue to oppress, that keep us up at night, that we go through ourselves and that we lament that others are, lament about the suffering of others. Oh Lord, we pray right now and we give thanks for your strength. For you indeed are our very present help in the time of trouble. 
So we pray, O oh Lord, for transformation. We pray for turnaround. We pray for us to be able to have the courage for the living of these days and the facing of this hour. Touch our hearts, O oh Lord, that our eyes, our ears, and our hearts might be opened again so we might be aware of the night sight that you have given us. That on the brink of every broken dream, every dream that has been deferred, every time we open our eyes, take a breath, lies hope for a new possibility. So we give thanks in advance for that possibility, for that hope, and that new beginning that can yet again come to us. Let us hold fast to it, O oh God, and if you continue to place it in our hands and in our hearts and in our minds, we'll continue to faithfully serve. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and all that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by people of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hopes and come on earth. With bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever. May it be so. Amen. So beloved, it is time for us to reflect on our giving and our generosity. And we are entrusting on this day that you will share your gifts and your pledges either electronically or you can mail them to the church, but please do not forget and to engage in generosity this week because it is through your generosity, through your pledges, through your offerings that we are able together collectively as Plymouth Church to construct a new reality in the midst of all of the deferred dreams that the systems, institutions, and powers of this world might give us. Yet we can construct a new reality together through our giving. So we invite your generosity throughout the week. So now let us reflect on generosity as our choir leads us in our offertory anthem.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, we dedicate the gifts that have been shared and the gifts that will be shared. May these gifts, every bit of generosity of time, talent, and treasure, may it help to construct a brand new reality, and most of all, equip us and empower us to be able to have night sight and offer that night sight to the world. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray, amen. Well, beloved, we have entered to worship, but now as we leave this place, we continue our worship where our real service will begin out in the world. Hear these words for our benediction, the words of the late Reverend William Sloan Coughing. Coffin, may God bless you and may God keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you the grace never to sell yourself short the grace to risk something big for something good, and the grace to remember that the world is too small for anything but love and too dangerous for anything but truth. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire through the power of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.